component of economic analysis is not good. And this is a famine. When you lower the price, you make the situation worse. Okay, so let's go back to Mr. Nova. He says, he says, planning then is despotic, too much power in few hands, the market's not working. But secondly, he says, it's extremely inefficient. You get, uh, you get this world, this excess demand, which is not corrected, and the planners make mistakes. They compound their errors. They should raise their prices and give the incentive to the enterprises to produce more, to travel up the supply, to produce more, to deal with the problem, not less. So, planners, according to him, or planning in general, this is one of the most famous criticisms of planning. Lobby written nails it right on the head. So I'm going to give you the critique, and then I'll give a criticism of this critique. So first, what Lobby says. He said, look, these planners, it is technically impossible for planners to get it right. They just can't do it. They can't figure out. He said that any modern economy with millions of separate and interdependent decisions. It's impossible for any set of planners, no matter how many, no, no matter how fancy are their computers, to figure out, to plan, to organize, to, to direct and control all the complicated interdependent decisions that have to be made to get the required inputs into a, a, a an industry to produce the output which will satisfy the demand. It can't be done. To produce more tractors, you need all kinds of different inputs other than labor power. And in order to get the required inputs to produce those tractors which you're guessing at, which will satisfy the demand by farmers for those planters, you have to make decisions about 87 different industries. And there's no way you can do that. And if you make a mistake on any one of them, it screws up the door. That's not a bottom line. If you make a mistake in any one of them, they'll screw up the rest. So even if, you, if some crazy way you get it right, you may have a bottleneck in transport. You can't get the goods fast enough to the factories to produce the inputs required to make a tractor. Very famous case in the Soviet Union. The planners worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked in order to get the requisite inputs to produce their outputs and the labor power allocated and so forth. And they discovered in order to do that, they had to run the trains, you know, to, to deliver all the inputs to the different factories across this vast country. They had to run the trains continuously. What happens if you run trains continuously? They will do what? They'll crash into each other. So you had enormous train wrecks. They just couldn't be. They, they can't do it, according to Noah. So he, he cites case after case in your reading in which the planners can't internalize all, in his language, all the externalities, the interdependent decisions on all these different producing units in the society, much less figure out what consumers want. This can't be done. He says, that's the beauty of the market. That's what the market does. The beauty of the market, according to him, is that it is this wonderfully efficient machine that coordinates all these interdependent decisions. Such as there's a bottleneck someplace, there's an excess demand, price rises, and hence that firm will produce more. So for individuals responding to these different kinds of market incentives will clear the market enabling the requisite inputs to be produced and allocated across a complex society. But, says he, if you do that, if you establish markets, then you're going to have the ups and downs of markets. And the way to deal with that, that's why he wants then 
macro planning, macro, not micro, macro planning in terms of the state intervening to deal with the externality that markets always seem to produce, which are unemployment, you know, downturns, inflation, or the other. So there we need the visible hand of the state to protect the invisible hand of the market. That's how he kind of brings together Smith and Keynes. That's why he's very famous. He was very famous for this. All right, so the bad side then. We got the good, the good side of competitive markets. Again, it's this political freedom for buyers and sellers, for producers and consumers and this efficiency that it brings about. But the bad side of markets would then, which is the business cycle, then would be uh, dealt with in terms of uh, macro <coughs> economics, or business, you know, these uh, taxes and government spending and the manipulations of the money supply. And he couples that, those two aspects, that are capitalist, of uh, his socialism, with this collective ownership of the means of production to get rid of the problem of the alienation of people from society because too many people are getting too much wealth through manipulations rather than that labor. So he sometimes called, um, I think people who do this, they disparage him, he sometimes called a left Keynesian, or was called a left Keynesian. I'm not sure that's fair, but in any case, that's what he was called. In terms of what we've done, so let's criticize this guy. In terms of what we've done, he has absolutely no idea of class in terms of surplus production. He writes about Marx, and what about Marx's entire life? But what is strange, what is weird, I never met the man, I would have asked him. Um, what is strange and weird is that he had, uh, he never understood surplus, which is Marx's greatest contribution. So nobody had really no idea of the production and distribution of surplus. When he does use the word class, he conflates it with power. He's a power theorist. In fact, to give an adjective to describe him, his entry point is power. So for him, power is really the essence of class, not of surplus. He doesn't understand at all that you could have uh, competitive markets, you could have just like he wants. He doesn't understand you can have that. You can have uh, uh, collectively owned means of, of production by the workers, and you can have state management of the business cycle and still have class exploitation in his so-called feasible socialism. That's what I taught you. He doesn't get it that the workers still could be producing a surplus for another group, even though he has his three features in that type of society. I want to now spend a moment, because it's so important in this, this is, uh, it should be part of this uh, uh, course like this. I want to go back um, to what we just did and do it again in a different way. Um, since it's that issue and so many things that are said nowadays, and it comes out of his work, and this is a critique now of Novak, it's a critique of lots, lots of stuff that's done. It's this view that the competitive market is always efficient. But that's what I'm going to criticize now. So I need a little bit, I gotta set, I'm going to set it up again since. I need to see if these things have to be done sometimes more than once. Here is the, again, I'm doing the exact same thing we just did. Okay? So here's a second shot. Here is the argument for competitive markets. This is a market. Big S and the big D. We just did. So you add up, that's the addition, that's the sign, signal. You add up all the suppliers, little s, and you add up all the demands. That's what a market is. It's literally the addition of each supplier and each demand. You add them all up. And the invisible hand, which is the market, brings about a perfect and wonderful balance or harmony between the two. That's what the market does. What is that? That's this. 
the market determines the price of the things being bought and sold. This is the introductory economics, so let me go back and do it again. Okay? Whoever taught this to me. Suppose this is something that I'm interested in, in uh, beer. I know you don't care about this. Suppose the price of beer, it's difficult for me coming from Boston to pronounce that, the price of beer, okay, is in downtown, I really can say downtown Amherst, but uh, it, where that town is, where the stores are. It's not really a town. It's a cow pasture. But <laughs> suppose the price then is three uh, cents. Or can it be? What will happen? There will be a riot. Yeah, that's correct. There will be a riot. People will be lined up to buy beer. There's an excess demand for beer. But the head of the line will be me. <laughs> Three cents of you know, clean beer. How does the market solve the problem? Well, at three cents a can, this excess demand is going to put pressure to bid up the price, and indeed the stores down there are going to stop raising their price. Suppose we make a mistake and the price goes to, you know, I understand it doesn't quite fit in the graph, but I hate my point across. $173 for a can of beer. At 173 bucks for a can of beer, there will be an excess supply. So the beer trucks will be arriving in downtown Amherst every 10 minutes, unloading their beer because everybody will want to sell at 172, three bucks for a can of beer. That's going to drop. This is what Smith discovered. He invented. So before you, no one kind of figured it out. What he figured out is that the market will determine the price that will pay the market. In which what? Supply equals the demand. Everybody's happy that the market suits. There's no way. The excess supply and excess demand is zero. The supply is equal to the demand. You can see. This has become zero. Another way of saying that is the excess demand is zero. The excess supply is zero. It's been competed with. That's the market. You can see the conditions for this to work now. The conditions are interesting. The conditions for this to work is there's got to be a lot of suppliers, there's got to be a lot of demanders, and it's got to be a fairly homogeneous product. Do you think of any way that we could have a non competitive beer market? from what I just said. There's got to be a lot of supplies, a lot of demanders, and a fairly homogeneous product. Be ingenious, because you're going to get a job. I mean, most of you juniors and seniors, you're going to get some of you going to get this job. If you paid under $27,000, you get a start. You can do this right. So there's a lot of money riding on this. How can you raise the price of beer and not lose any customers? Yeah. Well, so how would you gain your monopoly? You'd have to control Sorry? All the beer making capabilities. So you could, you could, where am I? You could kill some of these. Yeah. Shoot. Kill me. Kill them. Buy them out. Buy them out. Put it. Even better. You're not still. It's a different way to kill them. Anything else? Any other way? Yeah? Um, yes, you. Yeah. Um, you can say your beer is better than theirs. Absolutely. There you go. <coughs> what you would do is, besides buying them out, not going to off is that you run an advertising campaign differentiating, differentiating your beer. You produce a heterogeneous beer. It's not homogeneous anymore. Beer's not beer. Some beers taste better than other beers. What? After two beers, do you really know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, those corporations would try to differentiate their beer, and that means they don't compete with their competitors. So you do both strategies. The two of you. You can get more of the beer commercials. Differentiate your beer, you get a higher price. You get a, in economics, you get a relatively inelastic demand. So that you raise your price, and your total revenues go up. And that's inelastic. 
You never lower the price of the raisin. Or you, you do what you did. Old man Rockefeller in oil. You know what he did? I can write a book on this. He, a lot of oil companies around. They were pumping oil across the United States. We had a lot of oil in those days. <coughs> in Pennsylvania, lots of Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Texas, and then California, Louisiana. So he did what this gentleman said. He hired Pinkerton people to blow up the wells of his competitors. And then he could raise the price. So there's a thousand stories. So competitive market, you don't have that. The competitive market, you've got the market determines price. That's democracy. Because no individual seller then has any power over price, and no individual demander has any power over price. So the market then <coughs> dictates the price. So that's the market price. This is a competitive price as determined by the market. So a firm Technically, that's what a perfectly elastic demand curve is. Really what it is, is that it's a continuation of the arrow. That's just an arrow. That's all it is. But economists love this arithmetic, perhaps, so they say that the elasticity of this is infinite. It's got no slope. You can't ski on this. The market dictates the price. But you can go across country ski. So how much can a firm sell at that market determined price? As much as he wants. That's what perfectly elastic it can, it can produce and sell 17 trillion cans of beer. So what stops it? That's its cost. <coughs> okay, so you ready? So the profits of this beer company uh, what? The price of beer times the amount, a little cute, that it sells. This is the firm <coughs> in this industry. Minus all of its costs. <coughs> costs of what? Everything that it takes to produce beer. Wages, means of production, costs, whatever. And so the firm wants to know, the capitalists want to know, okay, this is an easy question. By the way, it has no control over price. That's given by the market. So that's a given. That doesn't change. Would the firm ever lower its price here to sell more? It's a stupid question. So be careful. Will the firm ever lower its price to sell more? Yeah. yeah. No. No, look at the graph. Don't look at me. Look at the graph. The firm can sell as much as it wants at that price. So it's irrational to lower its price since it can sell as much as it wants at that price. Will the firm ever raise its price to try and make more money? No. Because if it raises its price one iota, it loses all of its sales. They'll go the to the, buy from somebody else. If the pair of shoes is $100 in a competitive market, and if a producer of shoes tries to produce a shoe for $105, no one will buy it. They'll go to this other, the other shoe producers who were selling the same shoes for a lower price. So it would be irrational to get a, try and get a higher. You can try, but you lose all your sales. Unless, unless what? The only, the only one way to deal with that. There's a movie about this. Huh? That's right. What you do is you charge $105 and you don't lose sales, you sell sexy shoes. That was the movie. Sexy Boots was the movie of it. Good Scottish movie. So the market determines the price. So it's irrational to lower it since you can always sell as much as you want it to hire. How much you sell is determined by your supplies. It's nothing to do with the price. That's determined by the market. Yes, sir? I, was, I guess I was confused why somebody would try and lower it and try and get more in the market. But because they make a mistake. They, they didn't have this lecture. So they, they, they lower the price. They lower the, the, the can of beer is, or the shoes or whatever. The can of beer is, you know, $1.25. 
And they can sell as much, they can sell 8 billion, 17 trillion. <coughs> as much as they wanted a buck. So why, if they can sell as much as they wanted a buck and a quarter, why would they lower the price with all of 24? Since they already can sell as, that's what perfectly elastic means. Perfectly elastic. You do the arithmetic. You can sell as much as you want at the same price. That's what a perfectly elastic demand curve means. Yeah? What about uh, technology so they could make their cost curve yeah. stay entirely below the demand price? Well, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm asking. I'm going to show you precisely the answer to your question. Just hold on. Okay, so let's go back. So a corporation wants to know, how does its profits change? Okay, so it wants to change. So this, see this thing? That means change. Remember? The change in profits is equal to the given price, the change in quantity minus the change in cost. So that's what I want to know. How my profits, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm interested in profits. I'm a capitalist. I want to know how my profits change when the price is given by what? The market. So I want to know, that depends upon two things. It depends on how much I produce and sell at that price, and my cost. Because in order to produce more, you've got to hire more resources. That's the C. So the change in profits, <coughs> okay, relative to the change in output. I want to know, should I produce more or less? So I want to know, should I deploy that technology to produce more or not? I mean, that's the question. What's that? Let's do the original thing. Price minus uh, divided by change of Q. What's this thing called in economics? The change, and this one in English. Yeah. Marginal cost. That's called marginal cost. Let's do it in English. This is the extra, the enumerated, the additional cost a firm occurs by producing more. Okay, so the additional cost. So here we have a relationship between price and marginal cost. The extra cost. The firm wants to know, listen, should I produce more denominator and incur more costs? That's the question. Should I buy that machine with that new technology? Because that's probably good. Should I do that? And the answer is, it doesn't know. I mean, it's a good question. It doesn't have the answer. The answer is in this equation. So, if, look at this thing. If the price is greater than the marginal cost, what should the firm do? Should it buy that machine with the new technology or not? Should it buy the machine with the new technology or not? Yes. Yes. You always get two shots. Why? I thought you meant the price of the machine, not the... I'm sorry. This is the output. This is the beer. Why should it incur that cost? Do this in English. Suppose the extra cost because you buy the machine is $12 million. <coughs> so you're going to incur a new cost of $12 million. Should you do it or not? Yeah. Well, if price is greater than marginal cost, and write you down that equation by your elbow, um, then you're going to have a positive value on that side, which means that your profit per change in um, quantity is mm -hmm. positive, so you're making more money. So you do it. That's right. If you're in it, if you're below, if you're below the equilibrium, if you're over here to the left of this point, if you're over here where price is greater than marginal cost, then that machine may cost $12 million, but you can produce the beer or the shoes and sell them for $13 million. So when you get out of here, that job, you don't just look at cost, and you don't just look at the market price. You look at both. If you just look at one, you're going to be fighting. You lose your job. And when you get interviewed, because you're all going to go for the, you're all going to get the expensive, you know, dresses and, and, and suits and so forth. You're going to look terrific. 
I mean, you look terrific now, but you're going to look terrific in a different way. When you spend all that money, and when they interview you, and they ask those questions, bear this in mind. Because I want you to get the good job. You're not going to just look at the cost of labor or the machine or the machine. You're not going to just look at the market. You're going to look at both, because that's going to tell you whether the firm should expand or contract. Whether it should buy the machine or not. Okay? So, if price is greater than marginal cost, let's say Q1, you're going to, yes, then God damn it, do it. Expand. Buy the machine. Produce more, sell it. Why? Because the return, the return on output is greater than the cost of producing <coughs> So, you know, if it costs a penny, an extra penny to produce a piece of bubble gum, do it if the return is a, buck and a, half, uh, a penny and a half. <coughs> That's what this means. If you're over here, then it goes in the opposite direction. In this direction, in this world, price is less than marginal cost. So here the price dictated by the market. There's nothing you can do about that as a producer. That's competition. Here the extra cost of expanding output is greater than the benefit. The cost is greater than the benefit, so cut back. Don't hire. And by equal and by trial and error, the managers and the corporation get precisely to where price is equal to marginal cost. That's your efficient result. How do you know? Well, watch. If you're over here, your price is greater than marginal cost. If you're in that range, expand. And what happens to your profits? The firm is interested in getting the most profit. So if you're in this range, to the left of this point, what happens to your profits? Let's do it, let's do it. Like, I'm not getting it across to you. Okay, so let me do it again. Forget the graph from it, just common sense. Or uncommon common sense. It costs you, uh, it costs $6,000 to produce the car. That's the extra cost that you incur in if you afford to produce and sell that car. The fusion or whatever. You produce it and sell it, cost, it cost them six, but you can produce it and sell it to a dealer for seven. Should Ford expand? Yeah. Absolutely, because you get, if you're producing something, you get seven, and it costs you six. So you're making a thousand dollars per car. Multiply that by several million cars, you can see where they make the money. Hence, your profits are expanding. Suppose you're over here. Suppose now you incur a cost of this car. But whatever, $8,000, and you sell the car to a dealer for seven. Don't do that. That's a recipe for a disaster. Because it costs you more than what you can sell it for. And it's contract. Don't do it. Because if you do, there your profits are falling. Right here is when your profits are maximum. So in capitalism, according to the market incentive argument that nobody adopts, capitalism and competitive markets creates a situation in which firms maximize their profits. <coughs> That's the key part of microeconomics, or one key part. So when, when you have competitive markets, firms have maximized their profits that's precisely where supply is equal to demand for every firm, where supply is equal to demand for every industry. What a result. The economists have been working on that for 1776, 2011, 5 is uh, 2. 
235 years. So for 235 years, these characters have been laboring to show that the market deliverer, delivereth, we'll make it biblical, the, the market delivereth to people in society the maximum profit, the most efficient result, if you let competition rule. That's a hell of a result. You understand now why competition is so important to so many people, even if they don't understand this. Because it's the air we breathe. And it's the air that Novak breathes as well. Ready right now? I'm going to criticize this. Here's the criticism. Novak, and just about everybody else, assumes the following. They assume that the market price is P, which is determined by supply and demand, equal to marginal cost. This is efficient. P is equal to MC. This is efficient result. They assume that that price reflects the benefit to everybody in society, and the marginal cost reflects the cost to everybody in society. And that's wrong. That's just idiocy. So let me begin with the first people who discovered this craziness of the competitive market. Suppose a factory, I'm going to give you the actual example, first guy who did this. Suppose a, a, a capitalist builds a, a factory that's producing little cars and sets the price equal to MC, follows the rules. There's a competitive car market, okay? So gets the, the price is dictated by the market, just like I did here, maximizes profit, everything's bango, efficient, blah, blah, blah. But suppose one discovers that the production of cars <coughs> causes, let me take the car one since it's popular, pollution. The very production of cars causes, you know, air pollution. The you know, production of electricity in Japan causes, whoa, those nuclear plants now, that's a big one. We're now aware of that potential cost. But it goes for every single industry. So there's all kinds of environmental impacts on the production of commodities. Economists call these social costs. And the man who invented this was a conservative economist. His name was an Englishman, Pagou. He's the guy that came up with this. Just give him credit. P-I-G-O-U. Not Magu, Pagou. So he said, yeah, this was his argument. You build a factory to make a product, and the factory has a smokestack, if I remember correctly, and the smoke comes out, and somebody hangs up, gives her linen on the line, and the smoke destroys the linen. You can see the image. The production of any commodity may well create all kinds of social costs. So a firm maximizes its profits, sets price equal to marginal costs, but now let's be careful after Mr. Pagoga. <coughs> yes, that's only the private cost of producing cars. The private. We have to take into account the social cost. And if there's a social marginal cost, which is that people die from pollution, oh my goodness gracious, the market fails. So this is called market failure. Why? Because there are unpriced costs associated with production, and the market doesn't take into account one of the biggest problems in our, you know, there's a battle in Congress right now. So, say the critics starting with Mr. Pagu. Here's a cost that's external to the firm. It's called an, uh, political economy or whatever, or Washington, an external diseconomy. It's 
it's a it's a it's a, it's a, uh, a consequence which is outside of automobile production, which has disastrous consequences for the people who experience it. So private markets fail. The more, you know, if this thing is important, in industry after industry, you know, this pollution <coughs> problem, then the, the private market fails. P equals MC is not a good index of efficiency. Why? Because the marginal cost, the private marginal cost, is only a portion, you can see it, of the, of the cost that we have to incur. There are unpriced, this is price, that's good. This is raw materials, labor, and so forth, other inputs, inputs that the firm buys. But there's an extra cost, not associated with it, which the firm doesn't calculate unless it's forced to do so. So, the marginal cost of a firm or firms in general, does not convey to that firm and to society in general the full cost because of these diseconomies. The market fails. The market doesn't produce an efficient result. We should be producing fewer output in order to reduce this. We should be raising the price and produce fewer outputs because of this. The price has to go up. And so that's behind the taxes that you put on the various industries in the United States under these new congressional rules and the laws and so forth to raise the prices to make them deal with these marginal costs or to make them incur a new cost. You put scrubbers on the uh, smokestacks in the Midwest. That's the cost that these uh, corporations have to uh, absorb. And so here we have. You know, we have what Novig recognizes, which is the business cycle. That's an external diseconomy. He does recognize that. That's, that, that is a diseconomy of the market, the ups and downs. But he does, he does recognize alienation, too. He's got both of those. He nails the, you know, but he, what he misses, it's paradoxical, are all the other external diseconomies, the market fears. <laughs> Let's do this. Let me do a benefit. Because okay, so, I know some of you will, you know, will like the, uh, the benefit. Here's a bit. Here's a, here's a, a this economy on the benefit side. Suppose we have the following situation. You have a sports stadium. Suppose Kraft wants to build a stadium, wanted to build a stadium in downtown South Boston. The Yankees wanted to build, uh, and they did, a new stadium on, uh, my goodness gracious, South Boston, on the west side of New York, if I remember correctly, where I think the new stadium is. He wanted to build a new basketball place, play basketball, hockey, baseball, football, whatever. But the marginal cost associated with that is enormous. You know, they can cost, for a football stadium, it can be one and a half billion dollars to build one piece. And the price that you charge, it doesn't, you know, for the owner, it, it doesn't warrant it, so they don't get killed. So what will the owner of the football stadium, let's say, what's the argument he, she will make so that the football stadium gets built. Yeah, man. Tax the fans. Well, then that's the price. Tax, that's the price you have to pay as a fan. So the price is, is not high enough to warrant the stadium. So no matter how much, you know, whatever the price, it's not enough to cover the billion and a half. Yeah. You, sir, the red hat. Yeah. OK, well, whatever. Somebody. Yeah, for your job. Okay, so here's what they do. Now listen, here's another job for you. Okay? So, you know, for those of you who are economics majors, you'll be hired. Because the craft or one of these other characters will hire a firm to do a cost benefit study. And the argument is yes, here are the costs, but there are unpriced benefits to the city of Boston, which I'm not taking, be not taking into account. What are those? Those are the expanded restaurant sales and the jobs that will be generated in the hotels 
and so forth. All those benefits and the tax revenues for the city of Boston that will be generated from the additional sales taxes and so forth. So there's a, there is an unpriced benefit to the city of Boston which warrants a subsidy to build the stadium, to reduce this so the stadium gets built. That's the argument for stadiums across the United States. You'd say the market fails if you just examine the private price to the fans and the private marginal cost. You have to take into account unpriced social benefits. I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.